everyone. I'm Maren McKellen, Manager of Field and Experiential Learning and Study Abroad. We in the Global Ed Office thought it would be interesting to talk to our faculty to get their perspectives on the pandemic and how it relates to their fields of expertise. So with me today is Dr. Christine Monier, Professor of Sociology. Thank you for joining me today, Christine. Hey, Maren. Nice to be here. Um, so, Christine, somewhat quickly, our everyday vernacular changed to include terms like community spread, contract tracing, herd immunity, social distancing, and super spreader. Last year's self might look at this year's self and think, this is some good science fiction. So, it's easy to see why a sociologist would be interested in all of the social epidemiology of this. But why would a sociologist be interested in science fiction? Well, first of all, sociologists, we're interested in everything, which makes our lives miserable in general. But in particular, of course, uh, you know, we're interested, sociologists, we're interested in popular culture. Uh, there's a long tradition of that in sociology. We're interested in all the different uh, types of artistic production. And, uh, and of course, artists themselves, they're, they're, they don't create, they don't produce art in a vacuum. Uh, they're influenced by the world around them. That's where they, that's where they find their inspirations. Uh, that's how they choose whichever media they choose to produce art in. And, uh, and of course, they look at what's going on around them and produce art as a response to their response to uh, those social conditions. So uh, it, it's, a, you know, it, it's a combination of um, you know, small h history versus capital H history. And, is, and, and, and art production is, is part of that. Nobody is immune from looking at cultural trends and social trends and responding to that. And artists, of course, respond to that in their own uh, fashion. Uh, on the other hand, of course, vice versa, um, of course, artists have the capacity to change how we see things. So it goes both ways that artists and in, in their production are influenced by uh, what goes on in the world around them and all the social trends and cultural trends that surround them. But at the same time, they have the capacity to influence how we think about things and how we think about those cultural trends and, and, and so on and so forth. So in that context, I'm already talking too much. In that context, uh, <laughs> science fiction, is a subfield of popular culture and it's a form of literature. So of course, uh, it, it, it is within the purview of sociologists to look at, well, what do science fiction writers and authors uh, think about what's going on right now? Because a lot of what science fiction is, is looking at our society and extrapolate from that, from, uh, you know, from what we are living in and see, okay, what if we extrapolated on this aspect? What if we extrapolated on well, global pandemics. Uh, what if we extrapolated on uh, climate change? What if we extrapolated on our relationship with technology and social media? So what happens if indeed we face disasters? What if the internet entirely went down one day? What do we do? And so very often science fiction writers pick up on what are we collectively afraid of? What are the kinds of things that give us fear, that thing, uh, what are the things that we think would shatter our, our world, our civilizations, the, our way of life, and what do we think has the capacity to radically alter uh, our, our, our social conditions and, you know, our, our somewhat comfortable reality. So those cultural trends and those ideas are, are what a lot of science fiction writers kind of tap into. Now, I know science fiction, when you think science fiction, you think, you know, science, you know, space exploration, starships, uh, you know, laser guns, you know, and all these things. And uh, that's, to me, it's the, sociologically speaking, it's the least interesting, you know, cowboys in space is the least interesting aspect of science, uh, science fiction for me. And so what's interesting for me as a sociologist is the world building part. That is when an, when an author creates a new society from scratch, right? Uh, creates a new civilization. What does it look like? How do they design that, that society? How do they envision human relationships? How do they envision uh, the kind of building blocks of society, the political system, the economic system, uh, again, uh, racial and, and sexual relations and class relations? How is that all going to work 
account? How do they put those pieces together? And how do they deploy that in the literary context or, or movie context of how things happen? Mm -hmm. So, and, and we may think that, well, everybody designs utopias. Well, not necessarily. We've, and, you know, the, the science fiction literature is full of, you know, dystopias. That when things go wrong, we can't really imagine that if I have to design uh, for artistic purposes a political system, it's going to be a nice democracy where everybody's got a voice. Well, no, it's a lot more complicated than that. And, and a lot of science fiction writers, again, really do understand the complexities of social systems. So that's, again, and that is fully within the, the purview of, of sociology. Mm -hmm. So if I may give a couple of examples of that, will you allow me to share my screen? I will. Thank you. So here we go. So this is a good example of the big epic world building part. This is a classic. This is Isaac Asimov uh, Foundation. It's a, this is one book, but this is actually a series of books. And, and again, it's the grand design, the entire kind of world build civilizational uh, thing. And again, that's a classic. If you want a more uh, recent example, is that it's The Expanse. And it's a series of books first, and it became a, what is today, in my expert opinion, uh, the best science fiction show on on television and wow. so the authors are james i say Corey is actually two guys who write together under one name and the show started on the sci-fi channel and then they made the dumb decision of canceling it and it went to amazon and it and it is again really the the best again world building uh, it, and it combines everything it does combine space exploration with climate change and you know humans moving to mars and creating a society over there that is radically different than the society you have on earth and how do they relate out and are these people still the same humans when they've gone for so long and created an entirely different world and uh, all of those things again in the context of uh, resources running out and those kinds of things so those are two really really good examples of uh, the big world building that sociologists are more interested in so what changes have you noted in sci-fi literature in terms of the things that you that could profoundly alter our way of life? Well, that's really interesting because, again, uh, that was a really good question. So, uh, as I said earlier, right, writers and, and artists respond to social conditions. So, when you think about science fiction, you know, the, the, the book we consider kind of the beginning of science fiction, do you know which one it is? First science fiction book? No. Frankenstein. Really? Yes. Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, right? And what is Frankenstein about? It's about yeah. mad scientists. I mean, what is the role of scientists? And is there a point where scientists go, to, go too far in their pursuit of knowledge? And, and in this case, it, it leads to the creation of a human being that's not really a human being and that is and then cast away and, and, and et cetera. And then it comes back at the end and, and tells Frankenstein, you made me, right? I'm, I'm a monster, but yeah, you made yeah. me. So who's really the monster? So that's the beginning of that. But that question about how far science should go and at what point do scientists kind of step into something that is too you know too far is is a is a constant question the the more contemporary part of course when you look at the post-war period all the way to pretty much now of course science fiction was uh, influenced by two things and both were tied to the cold war one was the risk of nuclear annihilation and what would happen? What if somebody dropped, you know, somebody like the USSR dropped mm -hmm. a nuke on us? And also the risk of invasion. And so these two, two things turn into, there were a lot of political movies, right, made in the 50s about that. But for instance, this is a classic horror movie oh, yeah. made in the 50s. Invasion of the Bunny Snatcher. It's been remade. It was remade later on uh, in, in the 60s, uh, which was more an exploration of race relations, etc. But the Invasion of the Bunny Snatcher is the idea that when someone from the outside comes over and, you know, steals from us what what makes us individuals, our individuality, our free choice, and we all become like, and that was kind of the metaphor for what if we all became communists, right? Then we would all be the same people with no individuality and we would just be marching in lockstep, etc. And it is the idea that you're having the body snatchers, this metaphor for it is that what, would, what if from the outside we had this influence taking us over and depriving us of our free will, which is the essence of our, you know, American individuality. Mm -hmm. Now, the blob, the classical one, 
right? That's also the idea that what is this massive thing that is taking people over and removing individuals from society. But that's the idea of this invasion. We don't know where this thing comes from, maybe coming from space. And of course, every time you had, you know, weird thing coming from space, that meant the USSR dropped something on us. So that's the same kind of idea. The fly is, gets us back to the question, when do scientists go too far? And that's so this scientist, that this is again the really old one, which is the only one worth watching. It's the idea, okay, this guy is running weird experiments and then something goes wrong and then he turns into a fly and whatnot. And the idea is that, yeah, but again, he took the chance. He was going too far. He was too obsessed with the scientific pursuit. And, and does that, you know, mean you can do whatever you want? But it's the same idea. At what point? And in the 50s and the 60s, again, between nuclear bomb and et cetera, the question was, you know, we're having all this scientific progress. Is there a point where we go too far? And the last, the, 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 maybe not the last one, but the, the other thing, of course, was the idea of nuclear annihilation. What happens mm -hmm. if, if someone, and this is, a, this, is, this is a really bad movie, actually. And, <laughs> and I remember watching it, I was like, wow, this is funny, because this is right. This is this guy and his family, and the, a, a nuclear bomb has exploded in the United States. We don't really know what happens. And they retreat in the mountains. They have a summer house over there. And the idea is that, well, now that that civilization has collapsed, uh, all I need to do is defend my family and, and do, do this genre of, you know, something really bad happened, society collapses, and therefore the more traditional hierarchies of society of male dominance and, you know, white men taking over and taking charge, this is something, this is a, a theme that comes back all the way to now with The Walking Dead when we'll talk about that in a minute. But that's the idea and an orgy of looting. There's also the subtext. There's a lot of kind of reactionary movies of that kind. I say, well, uh, you know, faced with the changes coming in the 60s and pushing the boundaries of, of traditional morality, etc. and how do we defend ourselves? And so that's, uh, again, that's kind of the conservative and, and reactionary ideology that underlines those kinds of movies where uh, some, all of a sudden then, then some white guys say, well, now I have to protect my family because no one else is going to do mm -hmm. it. So that's uh, the idea. But I was kind of typical of the 50s and then you get into the 60s and you still have that theme of what if something weird happens coming from the outside? This is the original, the thing, not the Kurt Russell one, the one that you may have seen or maybe not because you never watched that stuff. Right? I did. Actually, you're reminding me that I think there are people who think they're not science fiction fans who are. Although I have to apologize to Jeff Goldblum because I think you dissed the more recent fly, but go ahead. But yes, I have seen these. Okay, so this one is a really old one. It's, it's actually called The Thing from Another World. And again, that was a big fat metaphor for, you know, what if we get some weird things coming from, uh, from you know, the, the communist bloc and turning us all into gooey, gross things. But that, always the fear. And of course, in part of the thing, and, and the, the Kurt Russell one is, again, scientific experiment gone wrong. And then yeah. all of a sudden, all these things happen. Swamp Thing, it, again, from the 60s, that's the same idea, right? Scientific experiment gone wrong. Uh, as a result, you get all these things. Now, I'm not saying all these movies were actually always good. Some of them were really very big stinkers, let's say. Now we get into the 70s, and things change because our concerns change. I mean, our fears of the USSR in the 70s were less. Um, for a variety of reasons, but because other issues came up. You know, if, of course, you know, uh, in the late 60s, Silent Spring came up, Rachel Carson's book, and we started to think about environmental questions. Mm -hmm. And we started to think about uh, environmental depression, but also we started thinking about uh, population questions. And uh, at the same time came, came the book of, you know, Paul Ehrlich's, but, you know, the population bomb that, you know, we started thinking about, okay, how many of us can, can, can we support on, on this planet. And so a bunch of movies kind of address that question is that, that of, of environmental and population. And Logan's Run is one of those, uh, one of those films that questions that. This is the premise of the film is that this society, this is a future society. And uh, basically people get euthanized at the age of 30 as a, as a way of limiting the population. And so unless Logan and his girlfriend decide to escape and see if they can live older than that. Uh, so hence the, the whole movie. And it started as a book and then became, it's actually a good one. This one is a good one, even though it looks very 70-ish for those of us who lived through the 70s. Yes. And, but that's the idea. That, okay, as, those are films and books that reflecting on what does population control, control actually mean? And in this case, yeah, that the radical option is that 
you don't let anyone live past a certain age. And, you know, when you say 30, that means, yeah, you got a young population, but ugh, uh, what, are, what are the, the, you know, what do you do to your society when you do that? Right. Soil and green, of course, which I'm sure you've seen. Yes. If you say no, I will never forgive you. But <laughs> it is about both, again, resource limitation and population control or, or the inability of a society of, uh, in doing so, in managing population and resources and therefore resorting to uh, you know, drastic measure, which is, again, age, you know, age elimination. That is, a certain age you, you, you have to go poof. And uh, what do you do for the resource part? And, of course, I will not spoil it. Uh, what, that, what does this society do for uh, mm-hmm. the absence of, of resource? But, again, it is the same kind of idea. And, again, it, ref- it reflects a shift in, in our societal concerns in the 70s compared to the, the old Cold War uh, tropes uh, that we had. Silent running. I don't know if you've seen this one. No. Uh, then uh, if you ever have in my seat, you have, you know, Professor uh, Shamali Asgankar. This is one of our favorite movies. This is where we, again, another reflection on the environment. Silent running is a, is a movie about when Earth has been completely depleted of its natural resources, and basically whatever remains of vegetation, flowers, and plant life is in space. And uh, this is uh, what this movie is about. So, uh, and again, if you ask Chamily, she can talk to you a lot more. Mm -hmm. But again, this is where really we started worrying about what are we doing to the environment, and we started passing a whole bunch of legislations, uh, Clean Air Act and all those things, and and we created under the Nixon administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, and this is what reflected again uh, into the popular culture. And then this one, actually, uh, that's really funny that, that I remember this one. This is actually a television movie, but it had it made a really big splash at the time. This was by, with this whole context of, we have to think about how we use resources. We have to think about the environment. We started thinking, we have to think about what we do uh, for energy. And in the 70s, we started thinking about, we, should be, we shouldn't be using that much oil. And so we shifted to different sources of energy. And, and for a lot of Western society, what did we turn to? That's a question. What? What did we turn to when we started thinking we should do something other than oil? Solar? What, um... No. Oh, that would be nice. Oh, nuclear okay. energy. So nuclear energy, and which was interesting because it brought back the fears of what we're doing with nuclear energy, but not in the context of the Cold War and, you know, who's going to drop a nuke on whom is now we're building nuclear power plant, pl- power plant and do we really know what we're doing here? Because this is a type of energy, we can produce, you know, energy with it, but do we control it? Do we know what it does? We know it lives, you know, it, it has a, you know, a life that is far longer than those things. And so The Day After is, uh, is a television movie, again, that had a huge impact and audience at the time for a TV movie about a nuclear accident. Well, had I known that, had I watched it, I would have gotten it right. And uh, so... And so the whole TV movie is about two hours is about what happens again when everything collapses because the, the effects are devastating uh, on that. So, and, and of course, the non sci-fi version, uh, you may have seen, of course, movies like The China Syndrome. Yeah. Uh, it's the same idea. So we, we brought back the fears of nuclear annihilation, but again, not in the context of the, uh, context of the Cold War, but in the context of we having a source of energy that we may not be able to harness fully. And then in 1986, of course, we got Chernobyl and say, oh yeah, that's a problem. So... I mean, and then, of course, there's a new version of the thing that comes, the one with Kurt Russell, which you may have seen. And again, this one is less about uh, invasion from the outside. It's more about, again, scientific experiment gone wrong, and then all sorts of horrific stuff happens. Okay. Now, you, this is also when we start thinking and worrying about pandemics and the idea of diseases that we take out everybody and that we wouldn't know how to control. And as the, as the, the disease spreads, our institution one after the other collapse. So the stand, Stephen King's The Stand, is you know, this giant book uh, that is kind of a classic in, of the genre. It's a little bit too religious for my, my taste because it becomes you know, good versus evil and you know, the God side versus the satanic side or the devil side. But it's, it's the same idea. When you have a pandemic that spreads and no one can stop it and progressively everything slowly collapses. And then what do we do? And, and you don't need zombies. This is not a zombie story. But how do we reconstruct? On what basis do we reconstruct? Do we, do we rebuild on, on greed and selfishness? Or do we, do we rebuild on community and, and connection? So that's uh, one. Stephen King made a television series out of it and it's really bad. So don't bother watching it. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Then come uh, the late 80s, 90s, and computers, and the, the more widespread use of computers and connected computers and the internet uh, come along, and here comes the czar, what we call cyberpunk. That means when we start thinking about our relationship to computers. Neuromancer, William Gibson's new, Neuromancer is the kind of considered the classic of, of that of that genre. And, and the idea that not only do we become more dependent upon computers, but to what extent do they do they control us? And so the reflection of we're letting the computers do all those things for us, but what is the trade-off of that? What is the price to pay for it? Uh, what are and then at the same time, uh, a lot of literature and movies explore, you know, how do you put tiny computers into your bodies in different ways and, you know, for medical purposes or for enhancement. And therefore, what does it mean to be human anymore in that sense? But Neuromancer is, is that idea. Um, and, and of course, you know, the movie The Matrix also tackled that more mm. in, in popular culture. But the idea is that what does it mean to be human anymore if we are so embedded into cybernetic systems? So, uh, so Neuromancer was kind of first big, big cyberpunk novel uh, as a result. This is a more recent one in Fumocracy, Malka Alder. And the idea again, what if the internet was actually the thing that governs us? What if the internet was the government because we decided that algorithms make better decisions than we do? And so how does that change relationships of power when we, make com when we let computers make a whole bunch of different decisions uh, on our collective behalf? So that becomes a, a major problem uh, in some ways and because it may look like on the face of it, computers might make more objective decisions, but what, are, what is objectivity mm -hmm. really? So that's, again, that came in the late 80s, early 90s. We really started thinking about our relationship to computers. And then of course came my favorite, Black Mirror. Black Mirror is a TV show from, you know, on Netflix for Americans is a series and, and, and it explores in thoroughly our relationship to technology, what technology does to us and what we do to other people uh, thanks to technology, uh, especially how does it change our identities and uh, how it changes our relationships. So there's a lot of different episodes that explore all those different facets of uh, what we do uh, with technology. One quick example, one episode explores what if we could block people in real life what if we had, you know, electronic implants in our eyes or whatever that allow us, if somebody's offensive to us or has done something to us, we can, we can block them. So more than in social media. Yeah, so they become really blurred to our vision. And uh, when they, if they talk to us, we just can't hear them. They literally disappear from our field of vision in real life as much as they would do in, 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 in cyberspace. And so the question is, yeah, wow, that's really, really uh, interesting. And one can conceive how this would happen. Or uh, there's another episode that's really good about, you know, parents always worrying about their children and therefore one woman has her baby embedded with uh, cybernetic implants to, uh, to avoid all fear and all negative experience. And so when something scary or weird or bad happens, then, then automatically that stuff gets blurred from, her vi from the, the, the little girl's vision. So uh, what happens at some point is when, when her grandfather has a heart attack, well, that gets blurred and she doesn't know what's going on and she can't call the cops or, or help because it's been blurred. And the idea is that should we be shielded from everything that hurts everything, etc. So cyber, you know, Black Mirror has explored a lot of, of, of those kinds of issues, but again, very much in relation to us and technology. And then we get to more specifically, of course, the, the question of the global pandemic. When something happens and then it spreads and it's a disease and we don't know what it is, and uh, we have all those, those things happening. And well, and, and that's a more contemporary concern, right? That if, you, if you've watched uh, the more recent version of Planet of the Apes, it, it ends with a global pandemic that will lead to what we know as the classical story of the Planet of the Apes. And, uh, and of course, The Walking Dead, which started as a, comic, as a comic series, which became a TV show, is about, again, some disease spreads, still don't know what happens, but then it turns people into zombies, so what do you do? And the question is always, uh, first of all, now those fears are global because there's no way to stop germs from spreading. You know, germs and viruses do not recognize borders. And we travel more than we've ever done before. There's more people moving around the world for a variety of reasons. So whatever needs to spread is going to spread and we're going to be the carriers. Uh, again, 
it, it is, you know, the numbers are clear that more people are on the, on the move in the world now than they've ever been at any other point in, 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 in history. So we can't do, you know, what medieval cities used to do. We, sh we close the doors and nothing comes in, nothing comes out, and we wait until the, it doesn't work that way anymore. Mm -hmm. But um, again, it, it means, uh, that means, and that, that whole genre, what we call the post-apocalyptic genre, right? When something happens that is thoroughly devastating for society, the next question becomes then, uh, what rises from the ashes? What kind of society do we rebuild if we ever get to rebuild one? Uh, and, and is it just, you know, life that is, to quote, that was Shakespeare, right? Life, nasty, brutish, and short, or was that yeah. Thomas Hobbes? Uh, never mind. But anyway, and, and, and again, what survives and what doesn't? And wh where do the fault lines of society land? You know, what happens to our class relation, race relation, uh, etc. So, uh, again, you have a lot of, of those things. And of course, The Walking Dead itself was not just one jar. Uh, that's not technically, you know, Cormac McCarthy is not a science fiction writer, but The Road, if you've either read or seen the movie, is the same idea, right? Disease spreads, not clear what it is, does, and from a dramatic point of view, it doesn't really matter, but then what do people do? And uh, and in this case, again, this is total collapse, and, and, and on, on, in the book, in The Road, I mean, in the kind of odyssey that the father and son go through, they pass through different ways in which this is what happens. Is solidarity even, even, even still possible? Are, are human relations even still possible in the context of something like this that basically destroys everything? Mm -hmm. And so there, there, there is that. And uh, let me note World War Z because, uh, as I noted, Max Brooks, uh, the movie was terrible and should be avoided at all costs, but the book is actually good. And uh, if you, the subtitle is actually more interested, right? An oral history of the zombie war. And if you read the book, this is almost like somebody conducted an ethnography of societal collapse. And that's funny because it starts with a respiratory disease in China. Wow. So when we, uh, I remember being in class in February when we started talking about COVID and telling my students, I'm like, wow, this is really funny because this is how, where was this starts? And then of course it, it was not funny at all. But uh, so, and, and, the, and, and the book basically follows not a hero, not, there's no hero journey, etc. Again, those are vignettes of what happens along the way when something like this spreads and what decisions do we make and, and those kinds of things. So that was a very long <laughs> exploration of where we are uh, and, and the current trends that I see in science fiction and horror genres uh, as a result, along with the history of it. No, it was interesting to see the more contemporary examples, especially when you looked back and sh showed the older ones. Um, I hadn't seen those in a long time, and wow, how relevant some of that is now. Let's uh, move on to, so there's also cli-fi, the cli-fi genre, which is climate fiction, that takes the effects of climate change as its premise. Do you have anything to add here? Yeah, and, and of course, right? Climate change is the, the issue. I mean, before COVID um, took center stage, certainly, I mean, the, the, the question of uh, exhaustion of resources, use of resources, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of um, concern about the environment in general and climate change in particular has certainly been uh, in, in, on a lot of minds. So, of course, a, a genre like science fiction would respond to it uh, in some way. So, let me show you a couple of examples of that. Uh, the Water Knife, Paolo by Sigalupi, is actually a, a science fiction writer, and pretty much everything he writes is cli-fi, climate fiction. So the Water Knife is, is one example of that, and it's called that because his job is basically, uh, in, his, uh, in, the, in the book, basically water has been taken over by private corporations, and they use water knives, uh, unsavory characters who are supposed to ensure that property rights by these corporations is respected and nobody steals water that they're not entitled to. The problem is, of course, water, we don't survive without it. So it becomes a privatized resources. What do mm -hmm. we do if somebody decides that we're not paying enough for it or whatever? So that's uh, an example of that. The Wine of Girl is also the, in the context of water scarcity, resource scarcity. And what do people do when, when again, our societies can only function on basically infinite access to natural resources. And if we don't have that, what kind of society do we have? And it, very often it's not a very nice one that, that is actually provided in a, in a lot of dues. And so um, 
the forms of exploitation of who has the power to seize the resources before they finally, you know, are depleted and use that as a form of power and exploitation. This is the same author. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wall, uh, John Lanchester is a British writer, is also in the context of population control and and, and in this case, reduction, not just in resources, but the amount of land that we can leave off. And so the wall is basically, the, the story takes place in England. And because actually in, in the novel, uh, the cost of climate change have, has been most felt by people in the global south. And, and, and therefore, migration to Western countries has increased, or at least tried to increase. So England built a wall. And every person, every young person in England now is tasked to go serve some time on the wall, which is an actual real wall, uh, repelling migrants, climate migrants, climate refugees uh, coming from the global south. And if they fail to do, th to do that, if they manage somehow, some get in, uh, then those young people who were serving on the wall are put out to see themselves. And they have to figure out how to survive in the absence of land and whatnot. So uh, again, it is very dystopic, dystopian in some ways, and it it also sh uh, shows. And in all the cases I've talked about so far, that you know the, the water knife and the wine up girl and this, climate change lead, leads to a hardening of society. When again, racial lines, class lines are more profoundly uh, marked and there's greater inequality and societies are again harder and harsher. And I'm going to leave it that, at that for now. That's so, my climate change thing. So um, before we move on, have you seen, okay, so before Parasite, um, Bong Joon-ho did Snowpiercer. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? I have seen that, yes. I would and consider that, that cli-fi, right? It is absolutely climate change, uh, climate fiction. Uh, if, you, if you remember the premise, right? So climate has collapsed and therefore most of the earth is not livable anymore, except for a small chunk of the population that lives on a train that goes round and round the earth constantly based on a supposedly kind of super well-designed engine, engine that is supposed to be able to go on forever. Now, of course, part of the premise is that we know there's a reason why this engine goes on. But what's interesting is that the train itself is kind of sliced and diced into social classes. Mm -hmm. So close to the engine, you have the upper classes who live in luxury and have all the space in the world and all the food and resources of the world. And as you go down the train, it goes all the way back to people who live in absolute poverty who basically have to eat insects uh, in order to survive. And so this whole train is like, of course, a metaphor for society that is, again, more divided. Yeah. That is, those people at the back of the train are not allowed to move out of their car to go into one, or they're only taken when labor is needed. Uh, the punishments are harsh. And, uh, and again, it's, it's, it's this other idea that, as society, in, in the case of climate, the, the, the co climate collapse makes society harsher. That's the, the idea. So um, what can you say about sci-fi as a critique of capitalism? It, it always goes hand in hand, right? Because, of course, if, if science fiction writers are going to examine society, they're going to examine the economy. And if, you know, it, when we talk about climate fiction, you cannot dissociate uh, resource consumption from any kind of economic system. And since the predominant one we have is capitalism, of course, capitalism comes up for a measure of critique. Uh, and, you know, so again, in Cli-Fi, you have a critique of how we have used resources mm -hmm. and how we continue to do so. Uh, and, and, and again, and how people in power may use their power to maintain their access to resources that are dwindling as opposed to other people who have to, do, to, to make do with a, a lot less than that. So throughout science fiction, any economic system, capitalism in particular, comes up for uh, for a critique. Again, this isn't new. If you look at back 1984, there was a, a harsh mm -hmm. critique of, of economic systems as well. It wasn't capitalism in that case, but it, it did come up. When it comes to the literature that is specifically focused on, on economics, well, uh, there is uh, Kuri Doctorow. He's a very prolific writer, very prolific author in nonfiction as well. He's all over Twitter, etc. And he's the one who's been uh, also uh, writing a lot about uh, economic systems and 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 what's going and what you know, imagining them in the future. And in some ways, you know, science fiction is not a total bummer all the time, where you know everything goes to hell. Um, 
there's there, there's also a genre of, of, of science fiction that is what we call uh, post scarcity, and but that means what if we actually have enough? What if we have enough for all our needs to be met? What happens? Then you might think, well, then everything's okay, right? If nobody has to be deprived, if nobody goes hungry, if everybody's sheltered and housed, uh, what if our, our, our material needs are taken care of, then there's no problem anymore. And of course, that's not the case. And what do societies become divided upon? And down and out in the Magic Kingdom, it, it's, it's, the imagine, it's the idea of a society where somehow we found an, an unlimited source of energy. So no one is really poor. Uh, materially speaking, and uh, life can be extended indefinitely. So then what? And then, of course, then you might say, well, our societies are not divided anymore, right? Because we don't have to fight over resources, but actually now the currency of that society becomes reputation. Mm -hmm. Reputation online, the reputation in social media, and, uh, what, and, and the more you have, the more you are respected, but what do you have to do to accumulate that new currency? Of course, uh, there's the circle, Dave Eggers. Uh, if you if you've read that, it's not really advertised as science fiction, but it is. You know, when social media becomes uh, really the source of everything, and therefore reputation and visibility becomes the currency. So we live in a wealthy society. We don't really have material problems, but that then the focus of our conflict shifts uh, to this aspect of things. This used to be one of my favorites. Jennifer Government, Max Berry, who's also a prolific writer. And uh, this is a this is a post-capitalist future where basically corporations have taken over and control everything. And so your last name becomes the name of the company you work for. And so one of the characters is actually a government agent, and uh, she be, she's named Jennifer Government. And the male character is called um, you know Hike and uh, Hike Nike because he works for Nike, and that becomes your name. And so uh, the, the idea that that you become a property in a sense of whoever you work for, and especially, you know, private corporation is, a, again, an, an, a very harsh critique of capitalism. The affinities also kind of looked at that and also in the context of social media. And I have to say that when I read this book, when it came out a few years ago, I missed it. I was like, what the heck is this? And this is dumb. And then, you know, a few years later with all Facebook and everything, and I say, okay, this guy was prescient and I was wrong. The affinities is what if our social relations were basically decided based on algorithms? And again, five years ago or more than that for me, it didn't make sense. Now it's like, oh yeah, geez, yes. And what happens where basically we lock ourselves out in, in, in little bubbles and part of the affinities is that you never know why you were put in a given group, an affinity. You're never told what the, how the, the algorithm sorted you and based on what criteria because it belongs to a private company and it's a proprietary algorithm. But from then on, once you're, you're sorted out in a certain affinity, then a whole bunch, uh, bunch of things happen to you and affect your life and it starts conflict between affinities in different ways. And so uh, it may be me that I missed the point back then, but that's really uh, where it went. And then, of course, again, Cory Doctorow, this is a, this is a set of um, short novellas. Uh, and it, it's really good in the sense of criticizing, again, uh, capitalism, how global corporations control pretty much everything we do, and uh, the different ways in which people may or may not push back uh, in different ways. So there's a lot that is very, but all those things are kind of woven together, right? You can't talk about capitalism without talking about uh, climate change. So I, a lot of the, even the, especially the older references from the 60s and 70s that you were yep. talking about, um, a lot of the names seem very much the same and not very diverse. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how the genre, is it getting more inclusive than it used to be? You know, are the women representing? It has. And it has not been without controversy. And a, a few years back, if you followed uh, the, you know, the, the science fiction literature genre has two very big awards, the Hugo Awards and then the Nebula Awards. And the Hugo Awards uh, became the, a bone of contention because a group of uh, actually very bad you know, white writers decided that, oh, well, with all those women and minorities winning stuff, there's no room for us. And they decided to try to game the system of awards uh, so that they would get, so their, you know, lousy books would, would, would make the cut. But so there, ha there has been controversy, but it is getting a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, diverse. Uh, 
in, in American literature, you have more women and you have more women of color, especially. And the last winner of those big awards is a black woman named uh, N.K. Jemisin. I didn't mention her because it's not really sci-fi, it's more fantasy and it's not really my thing, but I've read her trilogy and it, and it was really good. But her winning multiple times uh, has driven some white guys, you know, through the roof. But otherwise, yes, there's there a great deal more diversity, diversity in terms of, of, of race, diversity in terms of sex, uh, diversity in terms of gender identity with a lot more LGBT writers, uh, obviously writing as LGBT writers. And, and again, in terms of ethnicity, for instance, Severance is also a global pandemic book. And Ling Ma is the, the writer of it. She's, again, Asian American woman. And it, it's an interesting book because, again, it, the same idea, right? This is a pandemic. People start dying in a really weird way. And uh, what happens then? Again, what kind of community do we build, et cetera? And it, it's a really interesting kind of uh, journey that she follows uh, as a result. There is a ton of good science fiction coming out of China. The problem is for us is that, you know, it always gets translated years later than it did. So Invisible Planet is kind of an anthology of contemporary, and it's interesting because it's very different from uh, the science fiction you might read uh, from, but more and more we get good translations of, 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 of that. And, and so again, there's a, and, and because we are, we're dependent upon translation, there's only a tiny bit of the genre that comes to us. And again, mm -hmm. it always comes years later. There's a lot more that gets published and written and, and read in China, in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. And then we get some of it, but only kind of a little trickle of it. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you remember a few years, not too long ago, two or three years ago, we got the movie Arrival with Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner. And uh, Arrival is actually based on a short story coming out of Ted Chiang, uh, Stories uh, of Your Life and Others, which is also, again, Asian American writer uh, in this case. And Teddy Thompson is a Nigerian writer. There is African science fiction. Rosewater, again, is a series that's the first volume of a whole series of his. Uh, but there, so, yeah, there's more and more that comes to us uh, thanks to, again, um, better translation systems and, and, and more streamlined processes. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, we don't have the monopoly of reflection on our own societies for sure. And what's interesting, of course, is that these people tap into their own context of to build their science fiction uh, in, based on what they're experiencing. And so, uh, you know, when you write out of Nigeria, it's going to look very different than writing from the perspective of, uh, you know, American society mm -hmm. or et cetera. I do have a few minutes left and I'd want to say, because I've heard you say this before, just when we talk and that you say that science fiction is good sociology. And I good think science I, fiction. Good science fiction is good sociology. Oh, the bad one is said. not. Oh, okay, so good science fiction is good yeah. sociology, and I think you've given a lot of examples thus far in terms of why you feel that way. Anything you want to add about that one? or Because you did mention that it wasn't about spaceships and cowboys. No, and again, it's always about, you know, what makes us human. Uh, how would cultural, technological trends affect how we relate to other people? Rebuilding. Uh, yes, and, and even without collapse. I mean, there's... Uh, there's a really good example of, uh, of of Black Miracle Nosedive, where basically now in, in that society, every time you have an interaction with somebody, you rate them. You give them, you know, one, two, three, four, four stars. And that rating you have basically determines if you can get a plane ticket somewhere, what kind of services you have access to, if you even keep your job. And so basically you have to make sure that every interaction you have with someone else gets four stars. Because if you get less than that, it changes everything and it ruins in your life. And it also means you might say, well, that's nice because now people have to be nice to each other. But there is a, but bad things happen. Somebody may spill their coffee on you. Do you yell at them and then you get dinged because everybody else who witnesses can also rate that interaction? So, it, it, so it's a really, really good illustration. That you don't have to imagine total collapse to look at those things. And the idea of social credit, right, where we rate each other based on the interactions we have, that's something that's already going on in China. If you Google China social credit and it may limit in China where you can travel the kind of things you, you, you get so again you don't have to think about total collapse of society to think about how can we imagine trends and that's something that Black Mirror does really well is that you don't need total collapse to see how things could go really wrong I know, and I feel like if people haven't had enough of what we're actually living right now you've given a lot of good examples of how <laughs> of things that we can watch now okay 
Uh, we're winding now. Now, Christine, is there anything more that you uh, wished I would have asked or something else you want to add before I have one final question? One tiny thing, and again, it's entirely my fault because I talk too much, is that we haven't talked about the trend in surveillance. And one thing that the technology does, and the example I just gave about Black Mirror, is that those little devices we carry with us all the time are also surveillance devices. They're, they, I mean, Fitbit, yeah, if you wear a Fitbit, that Fitbit, that Fitbit we know, they don't really work in terms of making you healthier. They don't produce those effects, but they do make you monitor yourself more. Mm -hmm. And uh, even your texting app, I mean, uh, how long do you wait if you text somebody uh, and they don't text you back before you relaunched another text and uh, or trying to locate them if you have that capability. There's apps that allow you to do that. Uh, there's also, again, of course, uh, social media allows you to track people in all sorts of different ways. And more, and, and of course, in face-to-face, -face, you have all those cameras that we can use and we can say, well, that's really useful because now we know when bad things happen, we can have a video of it and we don't have to rely on uh, and that we know things are true. But there is also that we are more and more participant, not just in our own surveillance, but into societal surveillance. So when we thought about surveillance for a long time, we thought Big Brother was watching us, right? The government certainly is watching us. And we didn't really think, well, first of all, companies are watching us. And we're watching ourselves and we're watching other people. And by putting all this, the, all the pictures we take, all this stuff, we put that online, we contribute to a very intense and total surveillance apparatus in which we're not just the recipient of it and the, or even the victims of it, but we're producers of it uh, as well. So, and someone like Cory Doctorow is, has been very involved into those questions of surveillance. But that means, uh, those devices means in a sense that we're always, you know, to use Irving Goffman's metaphor, we're always front stage. We're yeah. taping from home and you can see stuff. So I've put strategic statistic books like I'm smart. And so we can, you know, control our environment in, in different ways. But there is a point, we, thanks to the technology we use, and we are constantly, there's a stream of data about us that's always circulating somewhere that someone's using, whether it's Google using it, whether it's Zoom using our mm -hmm. data or Facebook or, you know, companies like Zappos and just kind of as soon as we turn on a computer, we're producing a stream of data that's going somewhere and being used by somebody. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's ourselves. That was it. Okay. One quick question. One quick <laughs> final question. Star Trek, or Star Wars. Yeah. That's not even a contest. I even know that. Star Trek by yes. far. All don't, right. don't forward me the hate messages you're going to get about it, but. No. It, yeah. I knew you were going to say that anyway. I have a hunch. I had a hunch. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for taking the time today to talk to us about that. Really, really interesting. I'm sure all of our. Uh, all I'm of our so worried about full. the time. My God, I may have. I've made fun of all the other ones for being too long, and I probably just did the longest one. Talk about. I don't know. Eating. Maybe I'm going to keep you on for a little bit longer just to make sure. No. And I want to say, great uh, pick on the T-shirt. I appreciate that. Your field studies and study about it brought is yes. being represented there. So thanks for that. Okay, yes. Christine, thanks for, so much for doing this. I appreciate that, and uh, uh, have a great day. Thanks, you too. Thanks.